It's early, hours before the sun will rise. But for the driver and passenger of a sturdy truck on an unlit path, their day is only halfway over. They're miles away from any sign of human life, and it's eerily quiet with only the sharp whistling sound of the wind running through the grass. The driver keeps their eyes on the dirt path ahead, driving at a slow pace so as not to miss anything. The passenger hangs out the window, their face buffeted by the wind and dirt. In their right hand, a high-powered flashlight, which they're using to scan the horizon. They've been at this for hours, with no success. Suddenly, their breath catches in their throat, and they signal for the driver to stop. There, in the distance, they can see the shining emerald glow they've been looking for. The pair rushes from the car to where they saw the eyes of the animal they've been tracking all night. They quickly get to work, examining its burrow, setting traps so that it can be tagged and examined. They can barely contain their excitement and can't believe their luck at having locked eyes with a black-footed ferret. Hello and welcome to the Sedgwick County ZooCast Bite Size Bonus. I'm your host, Emily Bishop, and in this mini episode, we'll give you the zoo scoop on the efforts to reintroduce the black-footed ferret to its natural habitat. You're probably familiar with ferrets. They're a staple of pet stores nationwide, and domestic ferrets are often confused with black-footed ferrets. But black-footed ferrets aren't a domesticated breed. They're the only ferret species native to North America. Also called the American polecat or prairie dog hunter, black-footed ferrets are nocturnal and primarily solitary. As one of the monikers suggests, their diet primarily consists of prairie dogs. On average, a black-footed ferret eats one prairie dog every three days, and that has contributed to their decreasing numbers. Black-footed ferrets are a member of the Mastalidae, or weasel, family. On average, they're just under two feet long and weigh around two pounds. Their short, sleek fur is yellowish, with a white underside and faces. They also sport a black mask, black-tipped tail, and of course, black feet, which is where their name comes from. At one point, black-footed ferrets could be found in 12 states across the central U.S., as well as parts of southern Canada and northern Mexico. Today, they occupy less than 2% of their original range. Their diet of prairie dogs is part of the reason their population has decreased. Over 90% of a black-footed ferret's diet consists of prairie dogs, which means when the prairie dog population decreases, it directly affects the black-footed ferret population. Prairie dog habitat is severely affected by urban development and human-animal conflict, mainly direct removal by farmers. The spread of sylvatic plague also contributes to decreases in prairie dog, and therefore black-footed ferret, populations. The sylvatic plague is an infectious bacterial disease that primarily affects rodents. The plague bacterium Yersinia pestis is also responsible for pneumonic and bubonic plague in humans. Throughout the 20th century, black-footed ferrets continued to decrease in population and were declared extinct in 1979. But two years later, a wild population was discovered in Mititsi, Wyoming. A captive breeding program was then launched by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Currently, there are 30 black-footed ferret reintroduction sites across North America. Kansas's reintroduction site is located in Logan County, in the northwest part of the state. Black-footed ferrets were first reintroduced to Kansas in 2007. Here's Dan Mulhern. He's retired now, but he used to work as a biologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And he was present at that first black-footed ferret reintroduction way back in 2007. Well, that, that's kind of always the question, isn't it? Why do we do these things? Why do we try to conserve these species? And there are probably as many different answers to that as there are people who try to answer it. I, I lean more into the camp of these species were here before we were, you know, the ferrets, the prairie dogs, all of it. They were here long before we were, um, and they would still be here in good numbers if not for things that we did. So Congress, back in the 70s, passed this law, the Endangered Species Act, and said, you know, we're going to identify these species that are in trouble because of human-caused impacts, 
and this agency, the Fish and Wildlife Service, is going to take the steps it needs to to recover and protect these species. So that's why we're, why we're doing it, is because it's our legal mandate to, to do it. Once we've identified a species that's in this much peril, we are obligated as an agency to try and recover it. You know, philosophically, where you fall on that spectrum of are they valuable, are they not valuable, you know, to me, a species has value just because it's there in the first place. And, and it, it, it was there for a reason. Just like people are, are we're here for a reason. You know, we were, we, we came about through this whole process of this, this natural world developing. And so uh, I, I think they have as much right to be here as we do. And so we need to, I feel like we need to do the things to try and undo some of the things that we as people have done to them to cause them to be imperiled in the first place. And the efforts to reintroduce the black-footed ferret have been successful. Fish and Wildlife Services started with 18 ferrets. And from those ferrets, fewer than two dozen ferrets, the population has grown. There are now approximately 300 individual ferrets alive in the wild. Now, let's return to the sturdy truck on an unlit path where our episode began. These surveys aren't just a headcount for the black-footed ferrets. They're a checkup on their health as well. Basically, we go out in the middle of the night and we survey the land and look for ferrets. And once we find them, we go out and um, try and capture them in traps. Once we have them in traps, we can anesthetize them and assess their health. And then we also can give them some vaccines such as uh, plague and distemper. And that will ensure that their health and longevity while they're in the wild. Um, and yeah, overall, we can assess how the population is doing and, and finding any uh, wild-born kits. Um, so it's really, really important to survey um, the population here in Kansas. That was Dr. Heather Arns, a veterinarian at the Cedric County Zoo who aids with the reintroduction efforts. This year, she was able to examine a ferret who was unshipped, meaning it was born in the wild. This is proof that the vaccinations and surveys and conservation are making a difference. Here's Dennis Dinwiddie, the Director of Conservation at the Topeka Zoo. So black-footed ferrets are proof that we can save a species if we simply decide to do so, if we know that we need to put the resources into it and are willing to do that. These guys are the proof that we actually can be successful at that. So one more reason that most people might not think of for why are they so important, why is the conservation of black-footed ferrets so important? Because they are one of the species that taught us that we can save a species. Every year, the black-footed ferret population increases, and with any luck, they will one day be removed from the endangered species list. That's what's new at the zoo with the black-footed ferret reintroduction program. But keep listening after a brief message about upcoming zoo events to learn about a scientific breakthrough in increasing the black-footed ferret population. Follow the white rabbit to a land of wonder at this year's Wild Lights. Come face to face with one of a kind Asian lantern sculptures. Maybe a Cheshire cat will cross your path or the queen's guard of playing cards. Be the guest of honor at a tea party hosted by a hatter and a hare. Wednesday through Sunday, October 11 through December 17, from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Tickets start at $15 and are available online or in person. Journey through the looking glass at Wild Lights. You might be familiar with Dolly, the sheep that was cloned at the Roslyn Institute in 1996. But did you know she's not the only mammal to be successfully cloned? More than 20 different mammals have been successfully cloned over the years. And in 2020, Fish and Wildlife Services Conservation Center in Colorado successfully cloned a black-footed ferret. Elizabeth Ann is a clone of Willa, a ferret who died in the 1980s, leaving no living descendants. Elizabeth Ann currently resides in Colorado, and she will not be reintroduced to the wild. Instead, she's under scientific observation to see how cloning could be used in the long run to help increase the wild black-footed ferret population. Thanks for listening to this bite-sized bonus episode of the Sedgwick County ZooCast. For more information on black-footed ferret reintroduction, 
Be sure to follow us on social media, which is linked in the description of this episode. And check out our website, scz.org. I've been Emily Bishop, and we hope you enjoyed this mini episode of the Sedgwick County ZooCast. July 5th, 2018, Buffalo, New York. A squad of federal and state law enforcement agents armed with guns and bulletproof vests entered the single-story brick home of one Christopher Kasaki. This isn't Kasaki's first run-in with the law. He served probation for felony forgery in the past, but this run-in with the law will have much more dire consequences. Agents enter the home, making their way to a sunroom. They can smell it before they enter the room, a pungent ammonia smell that hangs in the air. Experts trained in handling dangerous exotic animals follow the agents inside. The sunroom holds six exotic cats, two caracals, and four servals. A few weeks prior, on June 22nd, an inspector from the United States Department of Agriculture visited Kasaki's home following his application for a license that would allow him to possess African cats. Kasaki withdrew the application before it could be properly processed. Upon arriving at the home, the inspector found eight caracal and serval kittens, one in a crate and so sick and thin that its hip bones and ribs protruded from its skin, a depressing and disgusting situation. In 2021, Kasaki was sentenced to 18 months in prison for trafficking exotic African cats. Through his website, ExoticCubs.com, he sold dozens of African cats, advertising them as excellent pets that will cuddle and love the people around them. While Kasaki's sale of exotic pets might have been shut down, this is a story that's too often echoed in other exotic pet bests. And these illegal sales aren't happening through back alley channels in the dark web. They're happening on websites that I can almost guarantee you, dear listener of this podcast, have an account on. Hello and welcome to the Sedgwick County ZooCast Bite Size Bonus. I'm your host, Emily Bishop, and in this mini episode, we're giving you the zoo scoop on the hashtag not a pet campaign. Let's say you're in the market for a new pet. Goldfish, boring. Dog, been there, done that. No, you want something more exciting. Something that no one else you know has. You want something exotic. What about a tiger? Doesn't get more exotic than that. So where do you start to go about obtaining this tiger? Well, you go to, of all places, Facebook. In a 2022 article, Vice reported that it took their team less than 24 hours to order a tiger on Facebook. 24 hours and half a dozen messages, and they were able to find a seller through a public Facebook group. If the price is right, you get it, the seller said in a voice note. The sale was set to take place in Yangon, the capital of Myanmar. We will make payment in cash. If you confirm and we have the tiger, I will call you. When perusing Facebook market for a lightly used car or treadmill, there's a pretty high chance you'll also scroll by a listing for some kind of exotic animal being sold through pet trafficking. And Facebook knows this is happening. They announced that they would be cracking down on wildlife trafficking and partnering with conservation groups to help remove animal sales from their site. And they've begun banning accounts connected to animal trafficking. A few years ago, Facebook and Instagram joined the Coalition to End Wildlife Trafficking Online, taking a pledge to cut online animal trafficking by 80% by 2021. This would be great if Facebook actually followed through. A 2021 report by the World Wildlife Fund found that the number of wildlife items for sale on Facebook actually increased by 74%. Well, at least Facebook is banning known traffickers, you might be thinking. The thing about a Facebook account is that you can always create a new one, and the deletion of accounts actually makes it more difficult for organizations like the WWF to track known traffickers. Additionally, that same report from the WWF found that in 2021, the number of traders on Facebook increased by 69%. 
Part of this increase is due to the Facebook algorithm. Facebook notices you follow a lot of wildlife pages, so it will continue to recommend wildlife pages to you because the algorithm notices an increase in engagement when you come across these pages. But some of these wildlife pages might actually be wildlife trafficking pages. Over the span of a few weeks, researchers noted that Facebook made 95 wildlife-focused recommendations to them through notifications and the suggested groups feature. Of these posts, 76% were posts about selling or buying live animals. This is pretty heinous, and you might be thinking, why would someone do something like this? For the sellers, the answer is obvious enough, money. An Asiatic black bear cub can go for $1,000, a leopard cub can be sold for $280. Reptiles, amphibians, and birds are smaller than most mammals and therefore easier to transport and more likely to be trafficked. Some turtle species can go for $1,500 each. It's a lucrative business. But for the buyers, it's a little more complicated. The people buying these animals are, for the most part, not some Cruella de Vil heinous villains. While many buyers are purchasing animals or animal parts for use in quote-unquote traditional medicine, which, side note, has no scientific backing or benefits, or for decorations in their homes as a status symbol, many people are buying these animals because, well, they love animals, or they at least say they do. They don't see anything wrong with buying an exotic pet. They might not even know that in most cases, owning a wild animal is illegal. These people see no difference between having an African gray parrot and a canary. In their eyes, caring for a serval should be as easy as caring for a tabby cat. And they see themselves as good pet owners. They aren't purposefully mistreating their animals, but they are mistreating their animals because exotic animals are not pets. The hashtag not a pet campaign is working to end the illegal pet trade. The Association of Zoos and Aquariums have partnered with the Wildlife Trafficking Alliance and International Fund for Animal Welfare to help educate the public on why exotic animals are not pets. While there are numerous reasons that you shouldn't have an exotic pet, we're going to focus on two main reasons that go hand in hand. First is the animal's journey. Often, the animals being trafficked are captured and taken from their homes in the wild. They're mistreated on the journey from their natural habitat to wherever they're being sold, often being injured or becoming sick in the process. A series of texts intercepted from a 2021 animal trafficking case show a conversation between two traffickers. The first trafficker is complaining about six adult toucans he's transporting that won't stop squawking. The response from his partner? Tape their beaks so they do not make noise and tie them up very well. These animals are mishandled and abused when being trafficked. Second is zoonotic disease. A zoonotic disease is any infection or disease that is naturally able to transmit from animals to humans. The way that animals are often transported during trafficking, in tight, cramped quarters, increases the spread of zoonotic diseases between animals and therefore to humans. 75% of new diseases discovered in the last decade are zoonotic, and more than half of all human diseases have zoonotic origins. The HIV and AIDS epidemic of the 1980s was zoonotic from chimps to humans. 2003's monkeypox outbreak was transmitted not from monkeys, but rodents and prairie dogs to humans and the West African Ebola epidemic of the mid-2010s was the result of sustained contact between humans and bats. There are a myriad of other reasons you should not own an exotic pet. All of this can be overwhelming, and it's easy to feel helpless when confronting an issue as big as animal trafficking. But there are things that you can do that make a difference. One of the easiest things you can do is being conscious of the social media content you're engaging with. The next time you see a reel or a TikTok of an exotic animal, ask yourself who is posting this and why. What does the caption say? What is the goal of the user who uploaded it? By being smart about how we're engaging with content online, we can ensure that we aren't promoting illegal or harmful activities. 
You can also be an advocate for wildlife. Talk to your friends and family about why certain animals don't make good pets. If your friend is telling you about how they want to buy a lemur or macaw, start a dialogue with them about why that isn't in their best interest or the best interest of the animals. If you're craving more information on this issue, or if you want to take the pledge to be an animal ally, visit notapet.net. By just being more educated on the issue of animal trafficking and the illegal pet trade, you're already taking strides to help end the problem. That's what's new at the zoo with the hashtag not a pet campaign. But keep listening after a brief message about how the zoo makes holiday shopping easy to learn about the most heavily trafficked mammal. Trying to find the perfect gift for a loved one can be tough. Shopping during the holiday season is stressful. So why not make things easy and get your loved one a gift they'll never forget? When you purchase the Sedgwick County Zoo's holiday gift membership, you not only get two additional guest passes, but 15 months of membership for the cost of 12. Enjoy unlimited visits to the zoo, early entry, discounts on special events, and early access to the Sedgwick County Zoo cast. Visit scz.org forward slash membership and select the holiday gift membership option to get started. This year, take the stress out of holiday shopping and give the gift of membership. I'm going to give you a moment to think about what the most heavily trafficked mammal is. Okay, got your guess? It's the pangolin. Pangolins, also called scaly anteaters, are found in Asia and Africa. Their bodies are covered in keratin scales that protect them from predators. These protective scales are part of the reason they're in such high demand. They're used in many traditional medicines, despite there being no medical benefits to such practices. But also, in some countries, their meat is considered a delicacy. Pangolins also potentially played a role in the coronavirus pandemic of 2020. When researchers used genomic sequencing to compare the DNA of the coronavirus in humans to that in animals, they found a 99% match with pangolins. Now, researchers stressed that this does not mean that pangolins are confirmed as intermediate hosts of COVID, but they can't rule it out either. It all boils down to Pangolins should be considered possible hosts for future coronavirus strands. So if we all want to avoid another lockdown in the future, it wouldn't hurt to end animal trafficking. Thanks for listening to this bite-sized bonus episode of the Sedgwick County ZooCast. For more information on the hashtag not a pet campaign, be sure to follow us on social media, which is linked in the description of this episode. And check out our website, scz.org. I've been Emily Bishop, and we hope you enjoyed this mini episode of the Sedgwick County ZooCast.